All right. Well, hello, everyone, and good morning. Um, for Fridays with Fiscal this week, we're going to be talking about USASR lookup tips. Um, I think this one will be interesting. I have um, a couple different things to kind of talk about as far as um, kind of navigating in the software and um, different, different things that we can use to uh, look up transactions and other information. Um, because this one is kind of a, um, a unique topic, I decided last minute to put together um, a PowerPoint. So um, I just posted that out there this morning. Um, so on our training and registration page, the same page you signed up for the, um, for the webinar, I went and put down here, click here for PowerPoint. So um, if you do want to end up downloading this PowerPoint to look it over later, um, to refer back to, that will be out here. And then also the recording will get posted on this page too. So a little last minute, but <laughs> kind of a split second decision there. Um, all right, so let me get this pulled up. So overall, um, what we're going to talk about is um, when you're in when you're in USSR, and I say this a lot, so you know, just being a broken record, being a broken record here. Um, but there is more than one way to uh, do a lot of different things in redesign. Um, so with looking up information, there is more than one way to locate it oftentimes. Um, a lot of this depends on user preference. So I'm going to talk about um, the benefits of the different ways of looking up information. Um, but you know, some things can, uh, you know, sometimes it's not you have to do it just this one way. Um, the main two ways that I'm going to talk about, the main two kind of like big categories that I've put everything in is grids and reports. And then within each of those categories, we're going to kind of break it down and talk about um, different options within uh, those two major categories. So for the first part here, um, I'm going to start with grids. And overall, when you are um, trying to look something up, so say you're looking up, you know, transactions or um, a group of transactions, when the grids come in handy, in my mind, this is when you're looking for something on the fly. Um, if it's like a specific thing you're looking up, a one-time lookup, like I want just this one purchase order or this group of purchase orders, um, not something that I'm necessarily looking up every single month, like I'm looking for something specific this time. Grids are also helpful when you're looking up information as part of a process. So um, some examples I have on here are uh, if you're looking to convert requisitions um, or if you are wanting to get a list of invoices for a specific payment due date because you're going to post those. Um, certainly reports can come in handy here too. But um, in general, if you're just kind of looking something up to then um, to then do something with those transactions. You can do a lot of that right within a grid. So especially when we're comparing this versus looking something up with a report, um, the report might be redundant because you're going to have to end up on the grid anyway. Um, grids are also helpful when you're getting a list of information to update. Uh, this is kind of similar to the second one. Um, but in my mind, this is um, mostly applicable with um, Maybe you're looking up a group of transactions for a mass change, um, or maybe you're manually inactivating some records. Um, if you do filter on a grid and then update as you go, then um, it'll basically like narrow down your list as things no longer match what you've entered into the grid. And I promise we are going to hop into the software too, um, but this is why I kind of wanted to have this PowerPoint because a lot of these are just kind of like the over um, the thoughts of what we're going to look at first. Um, so narrowing this down a little bit more specific, um, what I want to talk about is using the activity ledger 
verse using actually um, transaction specific grids. So your purchase order grid, what am I going to use, you know, um, when am I going to look something up on one of those individual transaction grids versus the activity ledger? And these are the questions that I kind of think over um, when I'm deciding, uh, you know, what I might use. And um, so that would be, does the group of transactions that I'm looking for contain a specific type of transaction um, or does it contain different types of transactions? So this is like, am I only looking for purchase orders or do I want to see a purchase order, then the invoice and the disbursement, like anything related to that? Or am I trying to find a group that contributes to a total, um, to like a monetary total that may contain different types of transactions? Um, the other thing that I would um, consider is do I want to see one line per transaction number or do I want to see each of the line items separately? And last, um, this one's pretty straightforward is do I want to be able to view, edit, or create a transaction? Like am I trying to do something with it or am I just looking up something for um, informational value? And here's where we're going to hop out and get in the software here. Make sure I'm not missing anything. Okay. So um, when I'm talking about uh, like transaction specific grids, I'm talking about under this transaction menu, basically all of these different grids that I can access within here. So um, you know, if I were to go to my requisition grid. I'm going to see one line per requisition number. Um, I have these all listed in here. I have a lot of different options on my left hand side if I wanted to print transactions or edit them, um, even remove them. Um, and just for example, um, as far as, you know, so say I want to look up which requisitions need to be converted. I can type one filter in there. I have my list good to go. Um, now I'm sure I could get that information on a report as well, but if I'm going to come in here and ultimately filter this down anyways, at that point it really just depends on if that's something that needs to be saved or how the district tracks it. Because from here I could just easily go ahead and check my, um, make my selections and convert these requisitions if I was doing um, if I was in that part of the process. I'm going to hop over to purchase orders next. Let's look at an example in here. Um, so with my questions and what we're talking about um, with, you know, which um, what do we want to use the transaction grid versus the activity ledger? Um, I kind of have an example. Let's look at one specific purchase order and see the difference in what we can see on these grids. So um, I have my purchase order already selected here. If I have my purchase order number, I can filter my grid down to that. Now in this purchase order grid, I have one line. I can um, see, you know, the basic information um, on my grid. This is all of the header information. Um, anything that I can add in the more option is specific to purchase orders. Um, but I could print this from here. If it was still open, I could have invoiced it from here or modified it. Um, but when I view this, Um, this is all the information you know I'm, I kind of have on my grid right now, but when I scroll down, I can see that there's a whole lot more detail here. I have a lot of lines for this thing um, that are being attached to my one line on the purchase order grid. Now, depending on what I'm using this for, like that may be great. You know, I don't I don't need to see all of these lines all of the time. Um, I'll stop scrolling here. 
but you can see that um, you know, there's certainly a bit more going on there. If I hop over to my activity ledger, enter the same PO number. Now I can see one line for each of the different line items. So I'm going to kind of sort this here. Um, I can see my PO item numbers. So not only do I get one line on this grid for each of the PO lines that we were seeing on our pop-up, but I also get a line for the invoice and the disbursement. Um, you know, I could narrow this down to just show me the POs, uh, the PO line items. Um, and really where this comes in handy, especially with a PO like this that has so many different line items, is if you're looking at you know, maybe one specific line item. You know, maybe you care about the account or the charge. Um, you know, that line has something outstanding uh, on that PO, and you're trying to track that down. So the activity ledger uh, may be a lot easier, you know, say if I only want to see what's happening on line item one. And then I took out my type, so now I can see the invoice and the disbursement. So it lets you narrow down a little bit more um, specific there. Let me uh, open back up my slides and make sure we didn't miss anything. Let's see. So um, I just flipped to the next one. And um, so on the transaction specific grids, you know that contains only the records for the one transaction type. And um, have some of the other functionality options listed here like we talked about, you know, you can convert or print. Um, oh, the more option. So uh, when we're on that PO grid, I said anything you can add to this grid with the more option is specific to that one transaction type. So it would be items that are related to the purchase order. Um, and then my other note here is that when we are talking about specific grids, uh, versus the activity ledger, accounts and vendors, those aren't on the activity ledger, um, not at least the information that you would find on those grids. So those ones you're always going to go um, to a specific grid when looking up that information um, on a grid. Now the activity ledger, <clears throat> so we saw with that, that has um, the multiple different types of transactions. So that's how we saw the invoice, the purchase order, the disbursement, and it had one um, line per line item. The other thing is that there's a wide variety of columns available in the more option. So if I open this up, I can see, you know, I have all of the different um, transaction numbers, but when I scroll down, if I wanted to add another column that was related to the disbursement um, or related to, you know, the invoice, the purchase order, um, I can add my account code. So there's a lot more information that I have access to add to this grid. So if I'm not actually, you know, processing anything and I'm simply looking up, this can be super convenient because I can pull pieces of information from all over the place. I do have a note um, to watch out for voids. So if there is a, like a void disbursement, the activity ledger shows um, a, another line for it. So if you're pulling reports from this grid or if you're you know, looking at the totals on this grid, um, just keep in mind with how that shows. Um, I believe it's you know, detailed more in the documentation, but um, just something I just wanted to kind of note while we're talking about this activity ledger is um, if you have a void disbursement, um, just keep an eye on how you're accounting for that total if you're trying to add things up. The next thing that we're going to kind of hit here is talking about grid filters versus using the advanced query. Um, 
now in our last example with looking at that activity ledger, I just hit a lot of different random filters that we put in there and saw um, how that kind of changed the information that we're looking at uh, pretty quickly as we bounced around. Um, but things that I would consider if I wanted to maybe um, see if the advanced query would be beneficial versus the regular grid filters is uh, which grid are you using? Um, is this something that the user is looking up one time or would they look this up? Uh, would they look up the same thing periodically? Um, and do I want to see all the information on the grid? So everything that I'm using as a filter, do I want to see that on the grid? Um, so one thing I would say, especially with that first one, which grid are you using? You know, a lot of the grids are straightforward. When you're using a specific grid, you may not have a lot of um, columns, but especially with this activity ledger, because we have so much information from so many different places that pours into this, it can be a lot. It can be a lot for the system, especially when you start entering these specific filters. Um, the system also loads you know, each time I put in one of these filters, I see my little blue bar up there that's going each time I, I take one of these in or um, I change them. Now, if you are looking for a really big list of information, like right now I'm on one PO, so it's not too bad. But if you're trying to get a large list of info from this activity ledger grid, the advanced query may come in handy because um, it can help narrow down your entries to just specifically what you're looking for all at one time. Um, so to use this advanced query, you just click on um, this button to expand it up here. And what you're going to see is um, basically this is this is just like the configure filters option that you would have on um, when you're creating reports. Um, so you'd take your properties from over here, drag them over, and then um, we, we're going to be able to put filters on them. So actually let me make sure I'm starting off with a blank slate down here. And let me grab my example. Okay, so for my example, I was thinking, um, Actually, I had somebody ask something similar to this, and I thought this was a really good one for your advanced query. So um, on this activity ledger, because we have you know, all the different types of transactions, um, I can search by specific line items. Now this can come in handy. Say we have a treasurer, it's their first year at the district, and they're not sure where something was charged last time, but they kind of want to just keep consistent with whatever account was used um, previously. So for this example, I'm going to say graduation, you know, graduation was coming up and they're, they want to make their PO and they want to find a line item that had a description that said something about graduation last time so that they can find an account code and then go look and see, you know, if they have, um, if they can chart, you know, make their charge there. So um, we're looking for a PO item. Um, so I'm going to bring the type over here and say equals PO. If it's something that was for graduation, then it was probably at the end of the year. So um, I'm going to go ahead and put a date range. So I'll use between and probably they didn't do it uh, before April, I'm thinking. And they would have charged that before the end of the fiscal year. So I'm just going to pick a date range. And then um, what I can do is come in here and um, find my item description. And I'm going to use contains so I don't have to do wildcards. So just any, if there's any description that has um, whatever word I type in here. Um, in my demo database, I really wish I had uh, graduation <laughs> in there. So I'm going to type a different word. but. For the purpose of our example, we're going to say, all right, um, you know, they'd type grad and uh, then we're, it'll find any um, item descriptions containing that. Um, once I have my parameters in here, I'll go ahead and apply this. It's going to load once. 
And then um, what that did is that filtered my grid down at the bottom here so that um, it'll only show me the transactions that are matching um, my three parameters that I've put in here. Um, so let me hide this. So especially if you want, if you're doing something more complicated too, uh, if there's like, you know, five fields you need to filter on, um, it can be helpful. And I have them hidden here, but I kind of pre-added some of my some of my columns over here. Um, so my item description, you know, each one of these contains the word that I had in there um, that I had filtered it down to, and then now I have a quick list of my account codes. So if I was looking to see, you know, what should I charge this to, I might look over, you know, these descriptions. Here's my list of account codes. Now I can go see where I want to, you know, which one I want to use for my new PO. The other nice thing about using advanced queries, and so this is why, um, you know, the one question is like, is this something that I'm going to use periodically? So say there is something that I want to come in here and maybe just look up everything that happened within the month. You know, I'm going to do that every single month or every week. Um, if it's something that I'm going to use on a regular basis over and over again, I can save this. save that query, and then um, the next time I come in here, I can just choose it from this list and I wouldn't have to drag and drop. Like it would just give me um, what I have here and then I could go, you know, change, you know, change one part of this and apply it. Um, I have another example in here. Uh, so sometimes you can also get a bit more detail. Um, so on our activity ledger, we have the full account code, um, but my um, other one that I have saved up here is if I wanted to look up um, by like only specific pieces of the account. And those you can find, um, you know, you can find different uh, fields to filter on um, under these properties by expanding these different categories. So a lot you can do on here. Okay, let's see. Um, yeah, as far as our grid filters, so I didn't really talk um, about those too much again just because we kind of use those naturally most of the time. Um, and our advanced query, so here are some notes that we talked about on this. Um, let's make sure we hit everything here. Yeah, I guess that was the other thing is um, not all fields used in the filter have to show on the grid. I mentioned that when we were talking about the questions. Um, but you know, that's the other thing. So this one, like we are seeing the item description here, but if I had, you know, other things that I wanted to, um, to filter on, you know, this grid already has a lot of different columns. You know, if it's something that's a true false, I may not need to see that true false as a column on my grid. Um, so I could use it in the advanced query and that would keep the columns that I have on my grid a little bit cleaner. The other thing I was going to talk about when we are um, talking about grids specifically is um, I know I kind of grouped these in two categories saying you can look things up on grids or you can look things up on reports. Um, but of course those kind of blend together in this part um, in the fact that you have a report icon, excuse me, at the top of your grids. Um, and they would allow users to generate reports kind of on the fly with the columns that they're looking at. Um, this option to, um, to use is convenient kind of as part of a process. So these are kind of like real quick reports just going to show the basics that you have um, in your columns. Um, and you can use them to like to start a report. 
um, or when you're updating records. So I think this one I want to hop back to the software to talk about. Uh, let's go to I don't remember which one I was going to um, do for my example here. So let me um, let's just go back to requisitions. Getting a little bit of feedback. So if everyone could just make sure they're muted for me. All right. I think that sounds better. All right. So um, if we're going to this requisitions grid, and then let's say you know uh, we just want to see the ones that have not been the requisitions that have not been converted. Um, when we started, I said you know maybe you'd come right here because if you're looking up a report ahead of time, you know, and then you have to come in here and you're going to have to find these anyway. Um, but maybe the person who converts these requisitions, maybe they want to have a list. Um, that they're just going to put in a folder and say, these are the ones that I was going to convert this day. So um, before they go ahead and convert these, they could just come up here, click this report icon, and then it's going to default to a PDF. They could generate their report. And it's just going to be a really simple, straightforward, just the columns that are on my grid. Um, it doesn't default to having any sort of um, control break or total or anything like that. Um, it would just kind of give a list so that, you know, maybe they just print that off or put it in a folder on their computer so that they can reference, oh, on that day, that's what I had in my grid that I was going to convert. Um, the other thing that this can be helpful for is um, is starting reports. So if you know that you are looking to make some kind of report uh, for requisitions, you're trying to make a custom report, if you put any filters in here, um, say we want you know, just the requisitions that start with A, um, I could come in here and I have this save as option at the bottom. And I can save that report and now that's going to put a report definition um, in my reports library. It, it'll look simple just like what we saw with that um, with the other one that we ran. But I could go in there and customize that report, uh, change the header, give it some control breaks, um, some totals, um, and add any columns that I might want. Uh, but that's kind of a nice way to get things started instead of going from like a completely blank slate custom report. Let's go, go to the report manager and we'll look at that. So right here I can see my rec starting with A. And um, so what we're seeing here is we have a property for each of those different columns that was on the grid when I saved it. And in my filters, I have the filter that I put in. It will figure out which operation is needed um, for that filter and then the value that you entered in. So with that, um, that's most of the um, most of what, mostly what I want to talk about with grids. So I think we'll kind of switch over and talk in a little bit more detail about reports, um, using different reports or different features of reports to look things up. Um, before we move on to that, does anybody have any questions about um, anything we talked about with the grids? Okay. All right, well, we'll move on then. So um, when, I'm, when I'm thinking about 
uh, if I'm going to use a report versus a grid, um, a couple things that I would consider. So uh, if I want an actual report, um, this can be helpful for things that happen periodically. Um, and when I say this, this is pretty much like, you know, you have your monthly reports that you run. Um, you have these standard things that the district saves regularly. Um, reports are also helpful with a larger range of data, um, especially when you get to the point where you're looking at different calculated fields for accounts, um, different totals, uh, when you're pulling, you know, purchase orders for an entire month or what's open for the fiscal year, those are things you can look up on grids, but um, with the report, sometimes that's nice because one, it can execute all at once, and then two, when you're looking through that, um, you know, you actually have the detail listed out on an organized report. Um, also, reports when the information needs to be shared with others. So, yeah, it's great you can pull up, um, you know, the information on the grid. If you are in the board office and you are processing, you know, you actually uh, run through some part of um, the process, whether that's payables or receivables, converting recs, those grids are awesome to work with on a regular basis. When it comes to sharing information with the board or um, maybe like the building and department heads that just strictly look at their numbers, um, their budgeted numbers so that they know what they can still spend, um, that sometimes is easier. Well, I would say that's probably easier to do uh, by giving them access to a report that's organized and just has what they need on it. Because um, as we saw with the reports from the grid even, that was kind of just like a quick um, quick snapshot of what they were looking at um, at the time. So first I want to have a discussion about transaction-based reports versus uh, account-based reports. And I'm sure this is something we've talked about before. I know um, it's been brought up. I've, you know, talked about it on tickets and that and that sort of thing, but I just wanted to take a minute to talk about really what this means. Um, and what we're looking at with this is um, the reports in redesign, there are basically two different types. And um, really this is this comes down to how reports pull information. Um, a transaction-based report is going to show information specific to transactions um, for a specified range. So these are reports like your purchase order detail, your disbursement detail, anything that lists out a type of transaction. Um, so if I think about a purchase order detail, when I run that report, let me come in here, purchase order detail. So let me pull up my parameters here. When I run this report um, and I go to my options, I can run this on a range of transactions. So any like starting purchase order number, um, or I can run it for a specific transaction date. So and actually, you know what? Uh, yeah, so I could run this for the entire month of July. Um, or if I wanted to just run this for half of the month, I could do that. Um, when I run this, the program is actually going to look at each transaction and it's going to look at the date that is stamped on each transaction. So each of these has a date that corresponds to it. It's listing each one of these things out and then it's able to add up the total um, with, your, with your subtotals that happen on here. So this is transaction based. I can see every single transaction that equal, that's contributing to this total. Now, in opposition to that would be um, one of my account-based reports. So if I have a budget summary report, you know, it lists different accounts, but the accounts don't, you know, they have totals that are made up of transactions, but it's not actually showing me every transaction with that. So um, if I do a budget summary, and 
And I just have this so it's going to show me my grant accounts. So when I look at this, oh, I had it in summary mode, but um, yeah, I probably should have run. Let me narrow this down a little bit more um, so it'll run quicker, but I want to take it out of summary mode real quick. Sorry about that. So when I run this budget summary, now I'm getting an account, um, but yeah, again, if this doesn't show me any um, any actual transactions, you know, when I look at the encumbrance total, it's not showing me, you know, and of course I picked one with all zeros, which was silly, but um, if I had a number here, it wouldn't be, sh be showing me specifically the purchase orders that go into this. It's showing me what the account screen has pre-calculated. Um, so yeah, uh, budget summary, revenue summary, cash summary. Um, the difference why this is relevant, and let me pull up my slide again. The difference in why this is relevant is because um, we need to think about this when we're thinking about what totals we want to see on a report. Um, so when you're doing the account-based reports, these totals are by month to date, fiscal to date, um, maybe your year to date sometimes. And um, we have this really big benefit with redesign where you can actually go back in time and now run these reports. Um, and you can get totals from a previous month. In classic, you'd always have to go just to like what you had saved or to the monthly CD for that. Um, so any account that is report based or <laughs> any report that is account based, when you're looking back, the totals that you're going to be able to see on those reports do correspond with a month to date total, a fiscal to date total. Um, the only time on any of those account based reports that you're going to see figures that represent only part of a month or part of a year is if you are actually there at that point in time. Um, transaction based reports as we saw with what we just ran for January, um, you can run those retroactively for just a very specific range. It, it can be half of a month. It can be two and a half months. Um, you know, transaction-based, you have a lot more flexibility because you're actually picking, um, you know, which, which transactions you want to show and those will feed into the total that you'll see. That one, it's interesting to wrap your head around. Um, I hope those examples kind of help clear it up, but um, certainly if you have questions on those um, as you're building reports, um, yeah, those ones, those ones are interesting. But I just kind of wanted to try and hit that, try and talk about some examples there. So again, hope that helps. Um, the next thing that we're going to flip to here is talking about the total as of period. Um, now this is only for account-based reports. Um, I just showed the example on the PO detail of how you can uh, go back and you know run that date range, but I also mentioned that now we can look back for you know even the account-based reports. So this is how you're able to do that. Um, the total as of period, we'll look at that field that's on those reports. And when you um, enter that in, um, you're going to enter in a date within the month, month that you want to see the totals as of. Um, it can be any date within the month, which is kind of can be confusing. Um, so if you were to enter 6-1-2019 or 6-30-2019, either one of those will give you totals as of the end of June of 2019 because you're really you're only telling the system the month. So let's look at this. Um, so let's go ahead and do 
let's just do a cash summary because probably shouldn't do my budget summary with all zeros again. Um, if we come in here and um, I have this field right here, total as of period, um, and it tells me if a date is specified, then the fiscal to date, month to date, and encumbrance amounts will be calculated as of that period. Um, right now, my current uh, system period is June of 2020, but let's say that we want to see um, December. We want to see what was it at the end of the calendar year. So again, I could put in 12-1 or I could put in 12-31. Honestly, I kind of usually put in 12-1 because it's, I usually just put in the first of the month because it's less to type. But um, I know that can be confusing because it is giving you totals at the end of the month. So if, if you feel more comfortable plugging in the last day of the month because that helps you keep it straight, um, feel free to do that. It'll work both ways. Um, let's generate this. And when I open this up, so I'm looking at these totals, my initial cash, um, my month to date received. So this is going to be the total amount received for uh, December of 2019. Fiscal to date received. That means that is July 2019 through December 2019. So all of these fields are going to show me a snapshot of where this was at the end of the calendar year just by entering in that date. Um, in order, you know, so I didn't have to go back and open any periods. Um, you know, in classic, this would have been something that they probably would have looked back at in their monthly CD. But the perk of this is like, I can say I just want the grant accounts. So now I have flexibility to get a custom report for a previous period. And let me make sure that's all I wanted to say about that. Okay. So uh, the next thing that I want to talk about with reports is outstanding reports. Um, this is kind of another category. These ones work a little bit differently than just your standard transaction based where I can plug in a range. Um, so these are kind of like a little outlier here. Um, the first one, outstanding invoices by vendor name. This one is um, pretty straightforward. It's the most straightforward out of these three. Um, that one will give you a summary of invoices that have not yet been posted. When you're pulling that outstanding invoices report, that is going to show you what is currently in your payables page. So when you make that invoice, it sends it to payables and um, it'll sit out in payables until it's posted over to disbursements. Um, if your district regularly posts all of their invoices and leaves that payables page empty, then this report wouldn't have anything on it when you're in that case. So they might be only using this at very specific times um, when they're doing their um, AP process. So again, yeah, currently in the payables page. When it comes to these next two, this is where it gets kind of tricky. Um, I've copied these notes in here. These are in the um, in our wiki under the um, SSDT template reports page. But these two reports are very unique in how you can run them. Um, they basically have special filters written in so that you have the ability to go back and see what was outstanding in a previous month. Um, for this first one corresponds to the disbursement summary um, before running the report if you temporarily change your current period to the period you want disbursement amounts reflected um, and then just run the report it'll show you disbursements um, that were outstanding at that time um, the trick here is that these reports basically use dates so anything that was um, reconciled like after whatever period you're running it for, it'll, it's kind of smart enough to ignore. Um, the outstanding purchase order report, this one runs on the current posting period. 
Um, so again, you can uh, temporarily change the current period to get a list of purchase orders that were outstanding at the end of a previous month. And we're going to look at an example of this one because I know this, this causes some confusion sometimes. Um, it's a pretty unique report. And I should, uh, let me filter this down so that we're looking better. So um, here are the reports I'm talking about, outstanding purchase orders. Now I'm going to open this one up real quick and just show you, uh, show you this special field. Um, you don't have to do anything with this. You don't have to modify this report, but um, I don't know. I feel like once, if you're somebody that's in here with the reports, then um, this kind of helped it make sense to me when I was looking at this one um, and trying to figure it out. Um, but I can see on my filters, I have my invoiceable flag, um, and that one can be entered, you know, yes, no, when, when you run the report. Uh, gen generally, when you run this report, you don't have to put anything in for invoiceable because here's your special field. Current period remaining encumbrance is not zero. Um, so really what's important with this report is, you know, at, at the point in time of the current period, is there a remaining amount? Uh, let me grab my example here. And um, let's go look at, um, I have one specific purchase order that we're going to kind of look at with this. So currently my system is in June of 2020. Um, here's my purchase order that I want to look at. And if I open this up, I can see at the current time right now in June, um, my purchase order is not invoiceable and I have no remaining encumbrance. So I'm going to run this report for June. It is not going to be on there. This purchase order is closed. It's not outstanding. It doesn't qualify. Um, but if I go look, and now we're putting some pieces together here because now we're going to go look at our activity ledger so we can see all of the related transactions. Um, and I can see that the purchase order transaction here was created in May, um, and then we closed it in June. My invoice and my disbursement happened this month. So currently, yep, it's closed. But if I was running, um, if I wanted to see what the outstanding POs were at the end of May, this would qualify. Um, so let's go do that. So in order to be able to generate that report, I'm going to go to posting periods. And I'm going to make the current period May. So all I have to do is click on this check mark. Um, in this database, May happens to be open, but if you have a district that has all of these closed, they do not have to reopen the month to do this. Um, they only make it current. So making it current doesn't allow other users to like put more transactions into it. Um, in fact, if they left June open and made May current, then like pe you know people would still be able to process in June. Um, so yeah, if they so they don't have to like be reopening uh, previous months to do this. So just our check mark. Now I can see May up here, and let me go back to my report manager. And I'm going to run this and um, you know, I was already kind of playing with it when I was testing. So if I just put the purchase order number in here, um, and now I could certainly run this for anything that was outstanding, but for the purpose of us generating this today, I'm just going to um, show you what this one looks like. So now that I ran this reporting period, May 2020, um, so here's my purchase order, the original amount, and the remaining encumbrance amount includes the full hundred dollars because at the end of May, it was still remaining. Now what you want to watch out for here, 
um, you want to make sure when you're using this report, um, notice that I did not filter this invoiceable true false. Um, you have your purchase order detail report and that works um, similar to like your classic one where you would say like, do I want it to be outstanding? Do I want, um, you know, do I want it to be, you know, all purchase orders or just the open ones? And so on your normal uh, like SSDT purchase order detail, you can still use that. But when you're doing this outstanding purchase order report on a previous period, if I were to filter this to only show invoiceable POs, in my system currently, this one's no longer invoiceable. So that would kind of squash my, my special filter that would kind of overrule it. So if you are doing this, just keep in mind um, this outstanding purchase order report, especially when using it for prior periods, um, you don't need to use that invoiceable field. And I have another slide that actually kind of um, talks about the difference between the outstanding purchase order report versus that purchase order detail. Um, so we can see, you know, the outstanding PO report is based on amount remaining for the current period where purchase order detail, um, if you wanted that to be for outstanding, that would only be based on the invoiceable flag. One can be used retroactively where the other one um, doesn't really run retroactively for outstanding status. Um, but it does, but the purchase order detail would allow you, I mean, you can run that for date ranges to see groups of transactions. So if it's not necessarily just outstanding or remaining encumbrance that you're looking for, you know, there are definitely other benefits to that purchase order detail report. And the last thing that I want to talk about here is uh, report filters. So this one comes up pretty often, um, specifically with the like filter versus the one of filter. Um, when to use either one of those versus using um, account filters. So I'm going to go through an example. This one's come up a couple times. It might be something that auditors are asking for at, um, for districts sometimes. So. Um, I'm hoping that this is an example that may be something that uh, maybe you've seen or may come across in the future. Um, the like operation, basically what we want to keep in mind here, the like operation when we look at that can be used with wildcards. The one of operation for filters can be used with commas. Wildcards and commas cannot be used together. There's not a way. Um, so if you find yourself in a situation where you think you need um, to use a wild card and like multiple times with like a list of things, that's when you're going to hop to your account filters because those are going to make your life much easier if you're trying to do something like that. So let me see. Um, I believe that this was the budget account activity report um, that we've had basically this asked for. And um, if I go to the query options here, um, what, what I've seen requests for is um, they want a budget account activity report and then they want the objects to be um, like, I think, hang on, let me see like 400 through 699. Um, or sometimes it'll be like, I want all of the 400 object codes, all of the 500 object codes, you know, and, and then something else. So people will try and type in, you know, can I do this and this, you know, something like that. Um, or even, you know, try and try and put this in here, like thinking that they can get those two different groups that that's not going to work. Um, for object, you know, pretty much like you can do one group of objects there. Um, you know, any object starting with, with five, you know, this would work. Um, so let's open this up. Um, 
so that so what we can see there that's pretty standard using those wildcards you see that on the filters throughout the software uh, basically you know there are different options but with the ssdt template reports since it's got to be one or the other we made it consistent in choosing okay you know so standard is going to uh, allow you to use wildcards um, but you can easily modify these so that if you need to have a list um, you can so um, again, I'm opening this report, going to configure filters. And when I look at my object, this is what I'm talking about. My operation is like. So that is what enables this to be able to use these wildcards. Um, if I wanted to switch this to a list, then where's my one of? Here's one of, so I could change this. And um, there are a couple of tweaks I could make to these parameters to allow this. Um, I'll tell you, actually, it just doesn't need these um, little quotes in there, so I can take those out. Um, there's more detail on, how, on using these parameters in the wiki, too. So, um, so if you are modifying this, but just a trick, if you're switching to one of, you can take those quotes out. And then when we um, go to generate the, the report, oops, and I didn't change, probably should have changed my description. Because that like use wildcard here, that's set up in my parameters too. So I probably want to take that out. Um, so now, oh gosh, anyway, <laughs> I would, I'm sorry, I'm kind of doing this on the fly. So, um, so I'm just going to show you how this works here. Again, in the wiki, it gives you examples of all of those parameters, um, <laughs> but we've been on here for a while now, so apparently my brain is having me type in. Um, not type these in the most accurate as I'm trying to go through. Um, all right, so back on track is the one of will allow you to do like basically you'd have to do a list of commas with no space. So um, you could only do one at a time. Um, now for this example, that's not necessarily what um, what was being asked for. It was more of a range. Uh, so the other option we have here is between, which we looked at this with the advanced query, is between is a range. So if I wanted a range, I could do 400 and then comma, so starting at 400, ending at 699. Um, so that's our other option um, with kind of tweaking these reports here. Anything more complicated than that, I would say that you would want to um, that you would want to use an account filter. And sorry, I was missing missing some of the chat. Let me make sure I'm caught up here. Looks like Michelle's got the answers there. Thank you, Michelle. Sorry about that, Nancy. Um, okay, so uh, let's go. So yeah, so if I wanted to modify my report, um, go ahead, I have those different options there as far as the object code. Um, but let's switch over to our account filters real quick. And we've looked at our account filters on some different trainings before, I think our report training, but let's just in this context, um, say we're going to, you know, create a filter um, for this range. And um, when I come in here, I have my object. If I wanted to have multiple lines, like this is where I could do um, multiple wildcards. So if I wanted to have um, this object, uh, like group with the wildcard, and then I wanted to have 
you know, this, I, and then have the 600s. So I could go through, and then this is where I would be able to basically have a list and have wildcards together. I could save that and then go ahead and use that on my report. I can also do ranges in here. So instead, if I wanted to do uh, 400 and then it'd just be two dots, no space, then I, would, I wouldn't need those first two if I was doing something like that. Um, so these kind of come in handy. And I'm not going to save this one up. But yeah, so just um, so just additional uh, something else to think about there when you are using your reports, what you're looking up. Um, you know, it's uh, it, it you know if it's something that you're going to do once you tweak it once too, you can save it. So if that's something that um, you may need, then going in there and just kind of modifying that one filter isn't too bad. Um, but that is all I have. Um, we're about to 10 o'clock here, but I'm definitely, if anybody has any questions, um, anything that we want to touch back on, please let me know. All right, well, I'll hang out for a minute, but if there are no questions, um, you know, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Thanks for signing in today, and I hope everyone has a great weekend.